So good morning and thank you all for joining me today for getting started with ArcGIS for Schools. I know that it's a bit of a busy time and I think it's a very busy day with results coming out in the north as well. So I really appreciate you taking the time to join me for this. Um, just, yep, thank you. Um, my name is Rachel Abernethy and I am have been working for Esri Ireland for the past year and a half and for the next upcoming year I will be working on the ArcGIS for Schools programme. So you'll be hearing a lot more from me and hopefully you've all can, can see me and, and hear me okay. I'm not going to keep my webcam on because I probably make the strangest faces when I'm trying to explain things but I just wanted you to know who, who I am. So I will I'll maybe put it back on at the end in case there's people that miss out on this at the moment. Um, so I will just turn that off again. So there we go. And I know um, I recognize quite a few names from the list of people who've, who've clicked attending. But if we haven't chatted before, then hopefully we can have a call or be talking over email after this at some point. And I'm on Twitter as well. You'll get the link for the school's Twitter account, but I have my own and I know that's where I've met quite a few of you. And once we've realized that connection, it's great to start um, chatting about things on there too. So no doubt we'll be in more in contact. I'm trying to click through this, there we go. So we only have an hour, it's not a very long time. And if all things were normal, we'd probably be in the Esri office and spending a day going through this. But I'm going to put into the next hour what I think are some essential information for you to get started with ArcGIS for Schools. And then throughout the next couple of months, well, I'll put more videos together and help you with as many things as possible. Um, for this, I'm going to assume that you do have an account and we're starting with what you do when you log in. But if you haven't signed up to the program yet, please don't worry. I will be sending that information after, after the webinar and you'll get the links and everything that you need to sign up. Uh, along with that in the email, I will provide a step-by-step -step on pretty much everything I'm going to go through. So you are welcome to take notes, but this will be recorded and I will send through to you um, information on how, how to do everything. So you're more than welcome to just sit back with a cup of coffee for the next hour and let me do the work. <laughs> um, and if you have any issues with seeing my screen or hearing me, um, please let me know. You can put a question, well, you can raise your hand and put something into the chat box. And of course, if you do have any questions, please ask away. I will try to answer them as we go through, but there should be time at the end. We will see how much I ramble on because I can be guilty of that. I can just talk away all day about this. So we will go through ArcGIS Online Essentials. Then we'll be creating a web map and a story map and go through some resources at the end of what you can do next and where to look at for more information. Okay, so you have received your login details for ArcGIS Online. That is probably coming from an email from me, or if you signed up a while ago, that could have been from my colleague, Aideen. So you want to know what's next. Well, I'm going to open my web browser now and log in and show you some of the key things that you need to know. So hopefully everybody can now see my browser screen. So I am on, I would just search normally for this ArcGIS online and then click sign in. Cool. Before I do this, I just have a little panel on the right hand side that I know you can't see, but it tells me who's, who's in the webinar. And I'm just trying to make sure it's not in, in my way of what I'm trying to click on. Okay, so I'm logging into ARC Online. I'm using my GIS in Schools account. So that is my username and password. And I click sign in. 
and you will see from the URL that I am logged into the Esri Ireland Schools account. So this will have your school's name or a shortened version or an abbreviation of your school's name in the URL. You can see that there are quite a few menu options and different pages to click on here. And you're initially taken to the organization overview page. The main thing to look at here really is your subscription ID which is just on the left hand side here. That can be important if you, if we need to talk to Esri support or get some help with something in your account. And I know from the list that that's had to be done already for somebody. So that is proof that that can sometimes be needed, but um, that is there, that's where you can find that information. You can also get an overview of your members and recent content in your account. At the top right, this is your username. Your details are here. You can log out from this menu as well. But you are an administrator. You have an admin account, which gives you complete control and permissions over everything in your school's account. But of course, that's not going to be the same for everybody. You will want to add more members to your organization. So they could be your colleagues, other teachers, and perhaps they would have an admin account as well. But then you will also want to add students to the account so that they can log in and do their work. So I'm going to show you how to do that now. So we're still in the organization tab and we click on members. So you can see in our school's account, we only have nine members and really it's just me logging in to use this at the moment. And to add more members, we click Invite Members. Now, there are three options here. Add members without sending invitations. And this is um, a useful one whenever you're adding students in because you have their username and password, and then you can hand that to them. It could be on a piece of paper in, in the classroom, or you have a spreadsheet um, printed out for them to get their details. There is Add Members and Notify Them via email. so you that will just automatically send the user with their email address, their username and password, and then invite members to use, or invite members to join using an account of their choice. So this is more to do with social logins and probably not what you want to do with the schools, but that's an option is there. I recommend adding members without sending invitations because then you have control over that username and password. When anybody else logs in for the first time, they will be prompted to change their password. So you, you will have that on record for a short time before they change it to one that is memorable for them. So we'll click on that and click next. And we now have two more options. You can add a member one at a time, or you can add new members from a file, which would be quite useful if you were adding a whole class at once. Instead of having to click through 30 times, you can just add them all in one go. I'm just going to show you what it looks like uh, if you were going one at a time and what information is required. So you add their first name, last name, email address, username, and a temporary password. There is a user type and a role, and these are the things that are uh, particularly to take note of at the moment. So user type, it, I would probably go for a creator as a default user type. This is really more dependent on if you are using desktop applications and other licenses. So for schools accounts, creator is a good option here. However, role is where you can really um, affect the user's permissions. And this is the important bit. Within this drop down box, we can see that there are a lot of roles to choose from. And some of these are default roles that Esri provides, such as viewer and user, data editor, and publisher is in there as well. But you can have custom roles and you can see we've got Lurgan role, Lurgan admin prep. Uh, as some of you may know, we did a great piece of work with the schools in Lurgan last year. So whenever we were working on that, we had specific roles for them. But you can see that we have student and teacher. So why would you want to have two separate roles for that? So that could be because with uh, a student, you don't want them to be able to share data publicly, or you maybe wouldn't want them to edit data. It just depends on what type of work you're doing. So that's why you have these two roles so you can differentiate between students and teachers. So you would click next and add the member in. I'm not going to do it like that. I actually want to show you the new members from file, as I feel like this is maybe more of a likely scenario. 
So you're asked to create a CSV file with these fields, first name, last name, email, username, the role and the user type and password. So I will show you, I've created one. I typed in all of these details myself and I've put in my own details as I'm not actually got my own personal login to this account. So I'm going to do that now. So I have that saved locally. You could have as many students here as you want. You can do it just for one, so that's fine. I've got that all written in. So what I'm going to do is click browse. Spoiler alert, photographs that will be used in a future demo. <laughs> so adding new user CSV, open. And you can see I've got the green tick because I've done everything right. So if we click next, all of the users that you're adding will come up here. And if you wanted to change something, you can just click on this pencil. And for example, you might want the username to say Rachel Schools 1, 2. So everything looks OK. We click Next. We review. There's some other properties that you can change. One thing I'm not going to go into detail today, but there are credits available to users and I just recommend setting an allocation and I will come back to that. But that's a useful tip there. So you can really just leave that as it is. Click next. You get the overview again and we click add members. So we now have 10 members in the organization and there I am. So I mentioned the roles to actually create those roles so that they come up as an option when you're adding a member. We stay in this organization tab, but instead of members, we click on settings. And on the settings page, I click member roles and we can see here there's the manage roles section. It tells you how many people are already have each of these roles and if they're custom, you can edit and delete. You can also then create a role here you provide a name, a description, and you can choose which privileges that role can have. So the important bit here would be sharing. If you were creating a student role, then you can say, yes, we want, we want students to be able to share content with groups, share with the organization, but we don't want them to share with the public, so we won't tick that box. So you would just save that, and that would be a role available to you when you're adding new members. And just to show this, there's the student role. If I edit that, most settings are enabled, but we can see in sharing, we don't have that ticked. So that is the organization and adding members. I'm also now going to show you your content page. For me, I think this is maybe the most used or most important bit. It's almost like your folder, your storage area for all of your files, data, maps, everything you're making. So you can see here, I'm just giving the game away completely because you can see everything I'm going to show you. Um, these are the names of the content items I have along with their type and their sharing properties. So you can choose to share an item with only yourself, with your whole organization or with the public. And you can also choose to share with particular groups, which I will show you in a second. I have the content organized into folders. This is just for your own purposes to know. So for example, I created a folder for this webinar. So I have everything in here. Everything is public so that if you click on the links throughout this, then you'll be able to access these maps. So I mentioned groups and you can see that I have also shared some of these items into a group. So I'm just going to open this in a new tab. A group could be useful if you have a class all working on a, a topic, but individual or separate projects. So say on volcanoes and there's four groups, they've all taken a volcano each. So you might create a group just by clicking on this button here. So it's groups along the top, my groups, create group. So I'm gonna give this a really meaningful name, project group one. You have to give tags to everything that you create in Arc Online so that you can find it again. You can change some settings. So I'm going to say that 
any people in the organization can view the group. Only those invited can join, but everyone in the group can contribute and everybody in the group can update all items. So perhaps one student would like to edit another student's map, then that makes that, um, then if that box is ticked, then they can do that. So everything else is fine. So if I create that group, I've created a group. So I'm going to invite my latest user, which was me, add to group. From here, I could also go to content and add items. So I could find some particular pieces of content or maps that that project group want to work on and add it in here. Just gonna go back to here. So I have just gone through a few ARC Online Essentials, explained you're the administrator of the organization, but you can add members to your organization. You can do that one at a time or through your CSV and you know to create different roles. You can also create groups so that you can share content and then you can organize your own content into folders. So that was just a quick overview of, of that. Uh, I am just going to maximize my panel here and see if ever, everybody's okay. Um, as I said, you will get all of this information afterwards too, but hopefully that makes sense and do shout at me if there are any questions, but it looks like everybody's everybody's okay. Great. So the next thing, what we're all really here for. If I can click my screen, time to make a map. <laughs> So here we go. I know this is what we really want to know. I'm just going to open my browser again. That was just a way to get back in here. So I've just shown you this content page. I'm now going to go to the map viewer and that's simply by clicking map along the top. So this is the map viewer. There are some steps along the left-hand side, and we're going to follow quite a similar, a similar plan here to show you around. So you can see that we are centered in on Ireland at the moment, but simply by dragging the map with the left click of my mouse, I can move anywhere in the world. I can also um, zoom in and out of the map and I think this is quite funny because every time or throughout learning GIS, you're always told there's so many different ways that you can do something. And even with something simple with zooming in and out of the map, this is the case. So there are four different ways. So one option is simply to use your scroller on your mouse. So zooming in and out. You can use the plus and minus buttons on the top left corner of the map. Or you can also double click on the map to zoom in. I'm just scrolling back out. Or you can hold in the shift key, draw a square on your map. Let's go somewhere else. And that will zoom in. Four different ways. I tend to stick to scrolling with my mouse, but you'll find the way that works for you. If you're zoomed off and panning to somewhere else in the world and you want to get back to your home extent, you can just click on this home button here. So we're back. You can also search for places in the search bar on the top right. So if I type in New York, USA, that will bring me to New York. You can also type in coordinates there and that will bring you to the, lo to the location. You will see that a little window has appeared for New York. This is the pop-up. And we can customize this so that it will show more attributes for the features. You can even add photographs in here. There's so much you can do. Um, so we'll come back to that, but I can just minimize that for now. And now if I just go back to our home, we're going to change the base map. So at the moment you can see we've got this dark gray theme on the map. So that is the base map. And if we click on base map over here, we can see we've got quite a few options uh, and I even have some Ordnance Survey Ireland base maps in here. 
I quite like OpenStreetMap actually, I will admit that because there are some good um, paths in urban areas, so I like to use it for that. But I'm going to stick with some topographic base mapping for this. Can't really go wrong there. So we now have our base map. There are some other things here. So we, I've kept this on the About page just as I went through some of those steps. We also have the content, which shows you what is on your map. And at the moment, we just have this base map. And then there is the legend. But of course, we don't have any data yet. But we're going to get there. And I will come along to these tools in a second. So let's, let's add some data to the map. The first thing um, you will notice whenever you log into your account is that there is already some data there. And they will be base maps from either OSNI or OSI, depending on where you are. And there will be imagery. There's probably some sort of boundaries, like county boundaries, and other um, base mapping and services available. If you don't have those, please let me know. But they should, they should be there for you to use straight away. So I'm going to add one of those into the map. So to add data to here, we click on Add. This will bring the drop down menu, and I'm going to click Search for Layers. So I'm searching in my content. Now, those items are actually already here because I added them in recently. But you can search with the tags, so OSNI. And I'm going to add the Orthophotography Current Layer. And I will click on this little plus. The resolution's quite high, so it can take a few seconds to load, but we've now got our imagery layer. So we'll just zoom in a little bit. I am going to show you this again soon, but yeah, the resolution's good when you zoom in. So that's adding a layer that you already have in your content. But what if you have some other spatial data that you're working with, perhaps a CSV? And I know that people like to see this one. So I'm just going to untick this so that it doesn't slow down the map rendering. Now, if I open my folder here, hopefully you can see this. I have a CSV of significant earthquakes, and I got this from the USGS. So I am just going to lift this and drag it onto my map. And straight away, because there is a latitude and longitude in that CSV file, those points are automatically plotted onto the map. So I think that's pretty cool. It straight away brings up the style of the layer, and it's showing the magnitude error. I'm just going to change that to the magnitude. And it's saying that the larger the point, the greater the magnitude. I'm going to change that so that it's symbolized by color rather than size by selecting counts and amounts. So you can see the colors changed. I'm going to click Options, then Symbols, just to make it a bit bigger, and then Fill to change the color. So I'll go from kind of a pale yellow color to dark purple. So now we can see that the earthquakes with the, the darker symbology have had the, they had the greater magnitude. So that's just something simple to show how quick you can visualize data on the map. So I want to show you something here, another CSV. Oh, wrong one. I have another one here called All Month Earthquakes. I'm going to drag that onto the map. But it says this data set is too large to add directly to the map. Instead, publish this data as a hosted layer, then add the hosted layer to the map. So I wanted to show you this because you're likely to come into some error messages sometimes or something coming up, and I want to tell you that it's perfectly fine. It just means that there's too many points in that CSV to go directly onto the map. So what we're going to do is I still have the content page open here, and I'm going to click Add Item from your computer. So from here, I will click All Month Earthquake USGS. Now, I've actually already added this in, and it's probably going to tell me that. Oh no, maybe I deleted it. So All Month Earthquake USGS, you can give it a title. You can add tags, earthquakes, 
world. We'll publish this file as a hosted layer. We want to locate the features by coordinates and the field name, latitude and longitude. We want to use location, latitude and longitude. Arc Online should pick that up automatically. So add item. Oh, that's it. I have already added it. New layer. So that will publish this service. And now that will be in my content page. So that just brings up an item description, but I'm going to go back to my map and I will click add again, search for layers in my content. And instead of searching for OSNI, I will search for earthquake. And here is my new layer that I just added. And now we get all the points across the globe. You can see there was a lot there. There we go. So that's two different ways to add the CSV. And with the one that was added in just by dragging and dropping, you can then save that to your content by clicking the options button and save layer. You fill that in, create item, and it will appear in your content page. So I'm just going to show another way to add data to the map. And this is if you want to create your own layer and the way to do that is through map notes. So again, I'm going to click add, add map notes. There are different templates, but I tend to stick just to the map notes template. And the example I'm going to do here, because it will lead into a map I'm going to show you in a second, are beach points. I click create. So in your map notes, you can choose to have points, text, lines, or areas, polygons within that layer. So I will choose stick pin and you can zoom in to where you want to place your point. And I'm sure some of you have seen because I have it in the folders, I have it here. I went to McGilligan Beach recently, so I'm going to put a point there. And you can just put point wherever you want. You provide a title, beach. Um, this was my visit to, to the beach on holiday, add a description, and then you can add a link to an image. So for me, that's why I have these open. These were photos that I did take on the beach and I have a nice view. There's so many here. So you could get photographs from that you take on your phone and if they're in a cloud storage or you can add them to your content page themselves. So I could just take one like this, copy image address and add that in here. Then I click close. I click edit again just to get out of the edit window. And now when I click this, I get beach, my description, and then a picture of my fo um, the photo comes up. You don't have to have taken the photograph yourself. You could just get a link from anywhere on the internet and add that in. So that is how to create map notes. And then if you wanted to add more, we click edit. We know we're editing beach points, you can add more. Once that is complete, again, you can save that layer to your content. And then that means that other people can then use that layer. So we've got a bit of a, um, a strange map here with our earthquakes and our one beach point and our orthophotography. But I am just gonna show you a couple more things here that I think are useful. So bookmarks are useful so that you can go back to, if I want to make sure I have a bookmark on McGilligan so I can come back there easily, add a bookmark, beach, enter. So then if I click home and then I click beach again, it will take me back there. So you could have loads of bookmarks. So if you're trying to go through a case study, particular areas, you could have those all bookmarked so your students know exactly where to look at. Once the map is complete, you can save it by clicking this button 
see of as, again, providing title tags and a summary, save the map and it will be in your content. So I'm just going to go back to this, make sure I have covered everything. So we opened the map viewer, we've added data to the map, we had CSV files, we had one that just dragged and dropped, we had one that we had to add to our content first, we had the imagery layer that's already in your account, and we use map notes. I showed you how to change the base map and add bookmarks, and we've saved the map. So hopefully that is okay. I am going to go back to the map viewer now with one I made earlier. And again, it's on McGilligan Beach. So I'm just going to open that up. While it's doing that, I'm just going to check that you're all okay. Everybody's fine. Questions? Oh, sorry, there is a question. Saving the maps, does that cover your question about it? So saving layers is the same as saving the maps. It's the same process, but there's two, they would be two different things. So you could save the layer itself so that somebody else could add that, that point layer to a separate map, or you could save, say this whole map, everything together. Then when somebody else opens that map, those three layers would be on it. So there is a bit of a difference between having, you can see here, if I go back to the content page, there's a web map. This is the one I'm actually looking at now, North Coast map. But then you've got feature layers, which are my points. So I could add that, the feature layer to another map and save it. But the feature layer will always be there and it could be in as many maps as you want. Does that help? I'm trying to, exp I'll try to expand this, the questions. Oh, yep, yeah, great. Okay, um, just put that back. Okay, cool. So I am now on this map. So I showed you the orthophotography and I just thought this was quite interesting because actually, as well as the current, there's one for 2003. And when I'm comparing those, I just thought, oh, look at the difference in the beach. I think that's crazy. So that's 2003, and that is current, which I think was from earlier this year. And again, I have my map notes, which, oh, they've just jumped. But if I click on these, I have all of my photographs added in here from my trip to the beach. So the view to Donegal, We've got all of these nice photos in here. So that was my, those are my map notes. So just to move on from this, uh, once you have this map saved, you can share it in different ways. And this is just the next step I want to show you of how you can actually pre present this to your students in a slightly different way. So once you have a map saved, you can click share and create a web app. Story maps, as I know some of you will know about story maps, are included in here, but there are other templates as well. So I clicked on compare maps and layers, and I did choose a story map, but it's an older style with a swipe tool. So you would click on that and click create web app. And I'm not going to go into that now, and I'm even conscious of the time we have. I've spoken a lot, but um, I'm just going to show you one that I've already made. So along with McGilligan on this map, I actually have some other bookmarks for Downhill Beach, Macro Across, Viewpoint and White Park Bay. This was whenever I was up home a few weeks ago and I was doing lots of beach trips and cycles along the North Coast. So I was just taking these photographs. The McGilligan photographs were for this, but the rest were just my own use, but I decided to put them all in here. So I have these bookmarked and I have more photographs with these map notes. So when I show you this app that has been built off the map, I still have my bookmarks here. But the interesting bit is McGilligan and the difference in the coastline. And instead of having to toggle layers on and off, you can just use this slide bar to see the difference. 
I just think that's pretty snazzy. So although I'm not going into huge detail now, I, I will provide step by step on this afterwards. So a different perspective, along with this map, I guess it is interesting. You can add more description to those points so that your students understand what's going on in terms of, say, the erosion on the beach or the different processes that are going on. But for me, I even find looking, you're, you know, you're looking down at the beach. There might be a better way to be able to visualize that. So another option, as well as the, the 2D map, is to put it into 3D. So I'm going to click on this and show you. So before I zoom in and do anything too uh, snazzy here, I just want to show you how did I actually get to this. If I go back to my content page, you will know that whenever we started looking at the map viewer, I clicked on map. But instead of that, you could click on scene to bring the scene viewer open. So this is where you get the globe. That is my North Coast scene that I'm about to show you. But there's some others there that you could have a look at and be inspired by. They're pretty cool. So you would click on New Scene, and that's when you can start adding layers. So this one isn't very complicated at all. I only have my Map Notes layer. And then I'm using one of the default Esri imagery base maps. So it isn't an elevation model where you're really seeing the size of mountains and things like that, but it definitely helps provide a different sort of understanding to where you are. So again, I have my bookmarks in here, which can be set up whenever you're creating the scene. And I just think this is really fun. So if I click on McGilligan, it zooms in here. And instead of looking down at the points, you can almost be, it's as if you're on the beach. And I think things like this would be really cool for the likes of field work. I don't know what's going to happen with um, field work and things like that. I'm sure you know more than me, but this could be used in a, in a way for doing that, or at least to be complementary to field work. So students can be back in the classroom and think, oh yes, I stood there and I stood right here at this car park, looking out at the beach. So instead of just panning and zooming, um, you can use the right click of your mouse to really move all around this. And then you can still click on these points to see the picture. So I just think that's cool. And again, each of my bookmarks, I just love how this zooms in and out. And it really puts into perspective how the beaches are connected. And especially if you were doing this on erosion, the difference between McGilligan and I will get to White Park Bay. Macro across, if any of you are along the north coast ever stop in at this layby because it has great views uh, along these landforms here and if i just click on that beautiful picture <laughs> don't worry i have other examples of other places for you oh and that was a good good idea there to close and down my my tab I'll just open it up again Got too excited with my with the arch and things in that in that photograph, um, and then lastly White Park Bay. So I think that's good fun. I had a lot of fun putting that together. <laughs> uh, so I'm just going to go back to here. So the scene viewer is great for a 3D view of data, panning and zooming above and around the data. In that one, I didn't go below, but you could have earthquakes plotted and there's a way that if you put that onto a scene because you know the depth you could actually have that point symbolized below the ground so then you would get an understanding of how the different depths of different earthquakes which is pretty cool i'm sure i'll find an example of that and send it to you afterwards and you can visualize elevation probably a lot better than using those default base maps if you had an elevation model. But I think those base maps do a good job, at least like you see the cliffs, you understand that you're on a beach compared to up in the mountains. So we're going to put everything together. Um, I realize now we're coming to quarter two. So I just want to show you then how to actually put the map, the app, the scene, 
and then additional information because at the moment it's great we've got those points there we're saying we're standing on the beach um in fact if i go back I'll, sh I'll show you the map in a second there were some signs about the erosion and um there's the rock armor and everything on mcgilligan beach but i didn't put any of that information onto the map apart from the photographs but you may be doing a case study on this or putting a project together and you want to add some text in your photographs and the maps, everything in one place. And to do that, we'll create a story map. So a story map allows you to create a narration through maps, photos and videos as well. You can embed content and it's useful, as I said, for projects and case studies. And the best way really is to show you, this is from a school in Cork that they've created this. And we have a lot of these examples on our website as well. So if you if you end up creating a story map or anything else um, as from a project in your school, we will put it on our website because we just want to show off all of the good work that you're doing. So this is very similar, but um, this is the North Kerry coastline. So as you see, as you scroll through, there's maps added so you understand where you are. There's description here. There's some gorgeous photos. It talks about the erosional landforms and you can click through a bit like a PowerPoint. So it goes through the sea arch, sea stack, each of those in turn. Coastal protection methods. Again, so you can see how the photos are added with the text over the top. Some more photographs. and a conclusion. And you can just see, you just scroll all the way through that. And I think we're all used to that now. If you just want to scroll and see everything, you don't want to be clicking all the time. So I couldn't really make anything better than that myself, but I am going to show you how to get started with it. So if we go back, let me just make sure that's okay. I'll stay here. I'm just gonna check this as everybody, we're all okay. There'll be time for some questions here soon anyway as i'll be nearly finished so we're back to the content page from here i'm going to click create story maps this actually launches a new site and you're immediately in to your story map but if i click back on my content on the other tab just kind of refresh this you can see my story map is already here it just doesn't have a title yet so it saves as it goes, which I think is very useful. So we might put in erosion on the north coast. A geography project. And then I want to put a nice image in the background. There's some of the dunes. So that is our title. And as you scroll down, it's really prompting you to add in extra details. So tell your story. You can straight away start typing, giving an introduction to your project, but then you can also click this plus button and find out what else you can add in here. So there's text. And if you hover over, it explains exactly what this means. There's a button. So if you want to link out to external content, a separator, which is just simply a line, but it breaks it into sections, you can just make it look nice. And then of course, embedding in, you can embed other content, but you can add in images, audio, video, and of course, maps. Now there are four pieces down here. And it's very interesting because this new style of story maps, uh, it's being constantly developed. So there's new things coming into it and the likes of slideshow and swipe, like, I created that other swipe app to show you and didn't realize that we could just do it straight into the story map. There's also sidecar and guided tour, which are similar to older style story maps that some of you may be familiar with. And they look really good if you've got lots of points on a map, say across the world or across a country. And as you scroll down through photographs and information, you'll, your map will zoom to that location. So I'm just going to say, welcome to my story map click enter and I get the plus again we can add in an image so let's add another 
So this is where it all began. I realized I did not show you this. This was the message or the sign I saw when I stepped onto the beach and I thought, oh my goodness, this will be, this will be a good example for this webinar. So sand loss due to coastal erosion. So then we might want to embed our map. So click map. So this will bring up all maps that you own or if there's some that are shared with you, perhaps in a group, you can click on that. So I'll put in my North Coast map. You can edit it here if you need to, but we'll just place map. You can change the size. I'll just make it a little smaller. The imagery should come up, but it can be a bit slow. For the swipe app, I'm actually going to click embed because it comes up slightly differently. And it is here. I'm just grabbing the link. So many tabs. Click paste, click add. And we can make that a bit bigger, cover the whole screen. Click the plus again, we're going to go back to map. I'm going to put in my scene. Place scene. And you can see that that is now embedded here. It'll make it a bit smaller. And you can do all the same, the same thing. Once you have finished your story map, it's saved to your content, but then you can preview it on other devices. So if somebody was looking on a phone, you can see what it looks like. They're just taking a second to load. <laughs> Go back to edit story. Once you're happy with it, you can click publish and it will ask you whether you want to share it right now with your organization, with everybody, or in particular groups, and then publish. Once it is published, you can still go back and edit it. There are some other options with the design as well to change the theme and to change the colors, and you can also change what the heading looks like. So there's lots to play around with in there, but just as a reminder, you're in your content page, you click Create Story Maps, and you're automatically brought in to this story map to start adding in your content, adding in your information, and it, it's basically guiding you through it. So that is a bit of the overview then from everything on ARC Online. And I'm just going to, before I just tell you some resources, I'm just going to recap a little on what we've done. Just making sure again, are we okay? Any? Okay. Oh, I'm just looking at your questions here. Um, the OSNI orthophotography layers. Um, so I will make sure they're in your account. Sometimes we just put in um, a couple of them. There's so many layers there that OSNI and OSI provide. So I will just make sure that you've got the right ones in your account. Um, because they are available, but it's a special kind of agreement that we have with OSNI and OSI, so all of the school's accounts can use them. So if you don't have the right imagery there, I will make sure you get it. And thank you, Imogen, for your comments there. Um, so just lastly, I know we're really close on time, but um, there should still be time for questions, but uh, let me just move this out of the way. Can see I've got this all docked on my screen to see your questions and then I can't move them away again. Um, there we go. So I'm just going to click back a screen. Oh, not the way I wanted to go. So I'm just going to go back into my web browser. So I just want to show you a couple of things. Well, first of all, we've gone through ARC Online and I have shown you how to log in, how to add users and make sure they have the appropriate role, adding, creating groups and being able to share content, knowing that there's different types of content you can have. So you have your layers, you have your maps, you have your apps and story maps. I understand that that can be a little bit confusing, but you, um, you don't need to get too worried about what they're all called. Um, and I showed you the map viewer 
and how to add data into there, CSV files, adding from your content, creating map notes, being able to save the map, and then you can share the map. There were links there, so you could just share the map as it is, but you can use it in a template, for example, my swipe app. You can then, instead of opening the map viewer, open the scene viewer and create something in 3D and be able to zoom and pan around, the, around that scene in a different way. Then you can put it all together in a story map so you can embed everything in along with your text. And that could be text like um, that you would have in your textbooks. So your case studies and different things like that. Um, and then, yep, saving and publishing the story map. And then once you've made a story map, let me know and it will go on to our website, which is here. So this website, this is where you can click to sign up to the program. We also have our school spotlight, which is where you can find that story map I just showed you, along with lots of others. So hopefully they will inspire you for some ideas. We have plenty of teaching resources here. There's probably a lot of stuff in here that I have almost explained, but in a different way. So you might find these are more useful. Um, there's lots of different options, whether you want to teach from the front, give to students, conduct field work, and then the resource type. So there's lots of things there that's on our own Esri Ireland Schools website. They are here. If you have a look through them and you have ideas yourself, you've created resources, let me know and we can put it on here as well. And you'll, we'll give you that credit um, that you helped us add, add these resources onto the website. And as well, we have geo mentors. So, this is when other GIS professionals could have come into your school to help with a workshop, but I guess I don't really know what's going to be happening with that. And I hate putting the word virtual in front of everything, so we're just going to emphasize um, maybe email communication between yourselves and geo mentors. So, if you would like to have a geo mentor assigned to you, and then it means you've got somebody else to ask questions to, although I'm always happy to answer them you've got that person. So let me know if you would like a geo mentor. And very quickly, there is a Learn ArcGIS site, which is actually from like Esri Inc. And they have, so they've had this site, but there is a new one coming out. And if you click on this button here, you can then choose Teacher. And you will see that we have our Lurgan Shared Education Project is actually featuring here, which is very exciting. And there's other uh, stories from other teachers. And if I scroll down, there is a community corner. And these are some other um, teachers, I think more through Esri UK. But I will say that I went to university with Miss Black, so I have to highlight that. Um, there we go. So you can look at those. And lastly, there are some other things, um, learn paths, which can be found through this site as well, which kind of give you a step by step through very similar to what I've done today. And I hope to make, I haven't made one of these yet myself, but I hope to make more on specific case studies or topics. So I'm going to send those links to you for all of this afterwards, along with step by step of what I've done, because I realize that all of that was very quick. I don't even know how I've just said all of that with, with three minutes still to go, but the last things are, there's the link to our website. You can follow us on Twitter. Um, you can send us an email. There's the school's email, or this is my own email address. I will get it from either. And just keep us up to date um, on anything you're doing. And if you have any questions on any of that, please just let me know. There are two minutes if you want to ask me anything now. I will open this up and see if anybody said anything. So just to go through some, um, I was asked at the start if you will have the recording to the webinar in case people miss that. Yes, you will. So I'll make sure that gets sent to you. So I hope that was okay. Um, Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I will be doing more of these perhaps on a specific um, topic and um, perhaps even little things like adding the pop-ups to the maps, like I could probably talk for an hour on those and make them look cool. Um, 
Killard Point. Um, so I'm being asked if there's work being done in Killard Point, you're going to do virtual field work there. I, I am not sure off the top of my head, but I can find out and take a look through um, and see if there's any resources on that. Yeah, if anybody else, um, I guess the whole virtual field work thing is, is going to be new. So if that's going to be what everybody needs more help with, please just let me know. Um, Karen, I'm going to write that down and make sure that I get back to you on that. So I think that is that is it. So enjoy the rest of the time that you have off. Good luck with everything going back into the classroom again. And I just hope that um, works out. Oh. So I'm just reading these as they come through. Thank you, Amy and Karen, able to take photos and do, yep. Yeah. So one thing, sorry, thank you for reminding me, Karen. One thing I have not mentioned here that some of you may know about is survey one, two, three, but goodness me, I've spoken for an hour already on all of this. I just thought, can't even get into that, but I will do another one on survey one, two, three. And that's a way, instead of those map notes where I took the photographs and then added the points when I was using my laptop, you could use survey one, two, three on your phone and have the map open on your phone and click the point there and then. So it's a brilliant tool, especially for field work. Um, and yeah, we have so many examples on that. So that's um, that's great, Karen, that will be amazing. So look forward to hearing about that. Thank you, thanks, Elaine. Okay, I am just going to stop this, stop my microphone, stop the sharing, and then this will close off in a few minutes. So again, thank you all, all very much and take care.